All right, can I ask everybody to sit down and we'll get started? Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask everybody just to take a seat and we'll get started. Thank you again for joining us here at uh, the screening of Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story, and this uh, panel, uh, uh, a, what we're calling a spotlight on women in STEM. And uh, a number of you I know work in the STEM fields. Uh, a number of you have children who are interested in STEM issues and are sometimes here with them. So welcome uh, to this panel. A special thanks goes to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for sponsorship of this movie and panel. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from a whole group of filmmakers who are making extraordinary films about women in science. Um, before I turn it over to them, I'm going to introduce, or before we hear from all of them, I'm going to introduce Doran Weber. Uh, Doran is the Vice President and Program Director of the Sloan Foundation, where he he heads an initiative uh, to help filmmakers bring scientific stories to the big screen. Doran is going to introduce our panel moderator, but I, I just want to say one thing about Doran, which is if you care about movies where there are women portrayed in the STEM fields, uh, Almost anybody working in this area has never been able to, it really owes just an incredible debt of gratitude for his 17 or 18 years of doing this uh, because most of the early monies that got these stories made into films came from him. So, Doran, thank you. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Kitty, for that great um, introduction. And we're thrilled to be partnering with Athena. I think this is our second time, and we have a, a lot of overlapping interests. Just briefly about Sloan, for those of you who don't know us, we're a nonprofit philanthropy, and mostly we do um, we make grants for research and education in science, technology, and economics. This is part of our public understanding of science technology program, and you can think of us like a multimedia company for science. So we uh, develop commission produce um, books, radio, uh, theater, television, um, films, and new media that have to do with science, technology, themes, or characters. Um, one example, a recent book of ours that's had some success called Hidden Figures, the story that became this movie that um, we made a, a grant to an unknown author named Margot Lee Shutterly four years ago, and the rest, as you know, is history. And that's a, a really important story that's still continuing to play out in the culture. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, television, um, for example, Black Hole Apocalypse was a NOVA show in January. It was the first time in 40 years that NOVA actually had a woman scientist hosting a show, if you can believe it or not. It was Jana Levin, a graduate of Barnard, I might add, uh, cosmologist. Um, but of, of, uh, and of course, in theater, um, uh, Photograph 51, the story of Rosalind Franklin, which Nicole Kidman played on the West End, which we're still trying to bring to Broadway by Anna Ziegler, was a, a play we supported. And we have several new plays this year at Manhattan Theater Club, one called Mosquitoes, about two sisters, one of whom works on the Large Hadron Collider, written by uh, a very promising, uh, successful woman playwright, Lucy Kirkwood. So, um, but of all these stories about women, um, the H Hedy Lamar for us is the longest, you know, serving because it was such an amazing story. And I first heard about it in 2000. We made a grant for a play called Frequency Hopping, Ensemble Studio Theater, and that play came out in 2008. We made a grant for a book by Richard Rhodes, Hedy's Folly. Then uh, the actress Diane Kruger commissioned that. Is now working on a mini series about Hedy Lamar, uh, which Google has joined, and we're hoping to see that come to fruition. And then in 2015. Um, Susan Sarandon and Alex Jean came to us with the idea for this documentary, and they, I don't know how many of you just saw the film, but it is a remarkable story, and it's the first time anyone has gotten the whole arc of the story out, and also Alex did an incredible thing, but they discovered this um, tape of Hetty, which is, you know, even uh, uh, they get, should get a research award for finding that, which really added a re an incredible dimension. So it's an amazing uh, documentary. Anyway, so today, for the, you know, to head on to the panel, what we're very pleased, in addition to Alex Dean's film, um, they're all projects that we've supported. Um, uh, in addition to Bombshell, the Radium Girls was a project that came through our program with uh, NYU for a first feature grant. Um, 
what the Eyes Don't See is a recent uh, uh, project that we're helping develop with the Sundance uh, Lab. Um, and uh, the burning season came through our program with the Tribeca Film Institute. So we're very proud of all these women, and we've been championing more and more stories. And we have many, many more, by the way, in development. Yesterday, we chose four new projects at Columbia, and they were all stories about women scientists um, or women who played, including the first woman botanist in the 17th century to circumnavigate the globe. She had to dress up as a man because women weren't allowed on the ships. So anyway, with that, I'm going to introduce Jen Schwartz, who is the features editor from Scientific America, American, and who comes via, um, I think, uh, New York Magazine, GQ, a lot of narrative uh, journalism. Uh, Jen coming in? Hi, Jen. OK, over to you. Uh, thanks for coming, and enjoy the panel. Hi. Uh, so women, STEM, and film, uh, this might either sound to you like an incredibly broad topic or a very specific one. Um, and I think it's both. Uh, and I'm excited to introduce these panelists because I think that their projects really span the range of what this kind of film can be, that it's not one thing or another. Um, so I guess we'll bring them in. Um, the first person um, who I guess some of you have met already is um, Alex Dean, um, whose project, whose film is Bombshell. And um, um, and for those of you who didn't already hear this, she is an Emmy award-winning journalist and producer, um, and she's produced documentaries and uh, series for Bloomberg Television, and she also writes for Bloomberg Business Week. Um, and she's also a founding partner at uh, Reframed Pictures. And if you could just give um, like a brief summary of Bombshell for people who didn't see it earlier. Yes. I'll give this back to you, I promise. Okay, yeah, there, I hear it. Okay, so Bombshell is the story of Hedy Lamarr. Hedy Lamarr was the most beautiful girl in the world, according to songs and reviews in the 30s and the 40s. She was world famous for her face, and it turned out she had a far more extraordinary mind. Um, this was a woman who was so brilliant that she was able to invent during the nighttime, when she wasn't on set with Clark Gable or Spencer Tracy or, or Jimmy Stewart, she was able to invent war weapons for the Allies to use against the Nazis during the Second World War. And her most famous invention was with a composer called George Antile. Neither of them had any advanced degree in mathematics or engineering or science. They had both left school as teenagers. They were completely self-taught, and they came up with this concept of frequency hopping. And that concept is a communication system that we still use in our Wi-Fi and our GPS and our Bluetooth today. Does this one work? Yes. We can stand, though. Do you want to stand? We can stand. I don't mind standing. Okay, next person, <laughs> um, Jenny Halper, um, whose film is The Burning Season, and she is uh, the Director of Production and Development at Maven Pictures, and she's worked on films including The Kids Are All Right and Still Alice, and recently she executive, was the uh, executive producer on The Kindergarten Teacher, which just premiered at Sundance. Um, so if you could come up here and give us a... <laughs> Um, just a yeah, brief description of uh, your film. So The Burning Season is based on a short story by a writer named Laura Vandenberg, and it is about a driven primatologist who takes her teenage daughter to a remote region of Madagascar. She's trying to save an endangered lemur species, and in the process of doing so, puts her um, relationship with her daughter at risk. It really is, it's sort of a little bit like Gorillas in the Mist, and if you imagine Jane Goodall, but if she was just a much worse mother in Madagascar trying to save, le save lemurs <laughs> instead of gorillas. Um, and we have a wonderful director named Claire McCarthy attached and are in the final phases of casting. <laughs> okay. 
the still on? Yes. Okay, uh, next, um, Shireen Davis, um, which is, uh, her film is What the Eyes Don't See, and um, she is an award-winning filmmaker whose uh, feature debut was um, Emrica, and she was named one of Variety's 10 directors to watch in 2009. Her second feature film was May in the Summer, and she has written and directed TV series, including The L Word and Empire. So, Shireen. Hi. Thank you. Um, so I am here, uh, I'm currently developing a feature film called What the Eyes Don't See, and it is um, based on a book, a forthcoming book actually, that's going to be published this June. Um, it is written by uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. And so Dr. Mona is um, a pediatrician and public health advocate. She is a woman who used science in order to expose what was happening in Flint um, during the water crisis. So it's a really powerful first-hand account of the Flint water crisis through her eyes. Um, she also happens to be Iraqi American, so it's a movie that's sort of part immigrant story, um, part medical and science thriller, and part crime drama. Um, and what I, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to tell the story and found it so empowering um, was that it's really the story of how a community came together. It's really a story about activism and how people can truly make a difference, um, which I think is really important these days. Thanks. Okay, um, next we'll have uh, Lydia Dean Pilcher, um, who, uh, whose film is Radium Girls. Um, and um, she is the founder of uh, Cine Mosaic, uh, which is an independent production company, and she has also uh, produced over 35 feature films, including uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, and currently she is in pre-production to direct Miss Atkins Army, which is based on the true stories of women who worked as part of Churchill's uh, special ops during World War II. Um, and along with her, uh, let's bring up Ginny Moeller, who is also uh, one of the film, uh, filmmakers of Radium Girls. Um, and this is her first feature film. And she has worked as a writer, producer, and researcher for documentary TV networks like Discovery and a and &E. And her current focus is on women soldiers in World War I and the European witch trials. So um, I will let the two of you describe Radium Girls. Okay. Um, you should start, right? You can start. Sure. So, um, so Radium Girls is based on the true story of women factory workers during um, World War I and in the, in the 1920s who painted glow-in-the-dark watch dials with radioactive paint and were instructed to lick their paintbrushes straight and got very sick. And the company actually had research that showed that radium paint was dangerous and they covered it up. And so our film tells the story of a group of women who fought back. Yeah, and um, Ginny and another uh, filmmaker, Brittany Shaw, wrote the screenplay, and they had just won a Sloan grant for $100,000 when it somehow got on a radar that I had been looking for an environmentally themed film to produce. I'm, I consider myself an environmental activist, but was feeling chagrin that I hadn't had a movie that I was using the storytelling that um, we're all committed to, to um, impact change. So I, when I read the script, I just madly fell in love with it, and um, it's, it's turned into uh, an amazing journey, making the film together with Jenny and Brittany, and um, you'll hear more about it on the panel. Great, thank you. Um, so to keep the discussion uh, from getting too deep in the weeds, there's two sort of things that I'm hoping we can focus on. Uh, one being uh, just telling the stories of women who either have had an impact on science directly or who have used science uh, to you know, make a difference. Um, you know, so they may not be scientists themselves. Um, and the other part of this topic really that's I think increasingly important is uh, how we produce really compelling entertainment while also um, honoring scientific clarity and accuracy and actually using that to make our stories better. Um, and these things can often feel quite complicated to pull off, and they are, but I also think that's part of what makes this such rich, um, alluring material to work with because it is so complex. Um, so, you know, with that, um, 
let's just jump right in. And you know, let's start with um, with Bombshell uh, because it, you know, we just saw it. Um, and one of the things that struck me about it was the way that you integrated sort of her work. Um, into the film itself, the narrative of who she was, and her, you know, almost these two sides of her, um, and doing it in a way that felt tied together as opposed to two separate pieces. But I'm wondering, you know, especially with your journalism background, how you approached initially doing the research on her science and the patent, and um, you know, what was sort of difficult to find out, and then ultimately how you chose to frame uh, frame these sort of like lingering threads that were not tied up. Just that at least those of us not speaking sit down, and the person who's speaking can stand up. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how did we approach the science with this? And there's a couple of answers. The the easy answer, the simple answer is. There are incredible scientists out there that I leaned on heavily to understand the science. There were some fantastic books already out. Um, what uh, stand out is Richard Rhodes's Hetty's Folly. I also leaned heavily on Richard Rhodes to help me understand what he you know, discovered. Um, but the deeper problem with Bombshell was that when I started making this film, I sat down with many scientists who told me she didn't do it. And I had to really face that as an investigative journalist. And although I had this reaction emotionally to them saying that, I had to sort of pull that back and go, OK, we'll investigate. We'll investigate. And so that meant really figuring out why there was the sense that she couldn't have done this and uh, why there was the sense that she had stolen this technology from Germany from this husband who did make weapons for Hitler. And I had to admit, you know, that sounds likely. They were developing radio communications. They were developing torpedoes. She was married to this man. It was something we had to address head on. And so what was really important to me was to start to understand not only, you know, the technical aspects of the science, but the story of the science, how it had come out to the world and how it had actually been manipulated as it had come out into the world. And the most interesting part of that investigation for me was really discovering that Robert Price, who you see a little bit in the film, and who was the great historian of secret communications, along with uh, Schultz, who was his partner, he had actually intentionally erased the line in a conversation uh, that he recorded with Hedy Lamarr where she said she had done this invention. And I didn't know that until I'd gone back and read emails between him and Anthony Loder, Hedy's son, that stretched back decades. And after reading through all these emails and letters and correspondence, I suddenly had a picture of a man who originally believed her wrote down exactly what she said, so we had it as a record. I did this. No, I didn't steal it from my husband. No, George didn't do it. He wrote it down. And then he began to talk to his colleagues. He began to talk to people about the possibility of making a narrative about her, her life. And she, he became enamored of this idea that she was actually a spy. And that narrative starts to take over in his correspondence. And then you see him redact that line. That line is suddenly missing from this record of her interview. You know, so I think the history of the science and how it gets out into the world is sometimes as important as understanding the, the technical aspects of that science itself. And that became incredibly important to me to show that there had been this myth to address that myth and then to move past it w with the science. Right, which is why the sort of being an investigator as a filmmaker can mm. be so important. And also recognizing that science is often quite collaborative. Um, so this idea of sort of silencing her was yeah. a little antithetical to the point of science itself. Yeah, um, absolutely right. <laughs> absolutely right. Thank you. Um, so Jenny, um, sort of continuing with this topic a little bit, um, you, you've adapted um, a screenplay from a short story of fiction. Um, so, yeah. So we're starting with a fiction story, um, uh, and and ultimately this is a mother daughter story and narrative, right, for, for the film. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that struck me most about the story, which I, I had read in grad school, because the, the writer, who's brilliant, was a classmate of mine and just completely couldn't stop thinking about it. The, the thing that I kept coming back to was this question of, if you had to pick between taking your care of your family and saving the world, what would you do? Um, and just really being drawn to that question. Um, and it, it, it was first that, then then doing the research and then learning more about the science background, I think, for me. But, you know, even going in that order, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you could be forgiven for not <laughs> bringing on a science advisor, which you have, and you've done a lot of, you know, you've done a lot of work and research into looking into this, not just talking to one primatologist, but multiple ones. And um, I'm sort of wondering why you find that important to do and how it actually helps you develop the story, if it um, has any benefits besides also, you know, adding those layers of sort of complication that, you know, different scientists might say different things. But how has it actually um, helped you form the narrative of the story? I mean, it was, it was a huge help. So the short story was a 20-page short story, and expanding it was actually a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, the, sc the screenplay is called The Burning Season. The screen... Oh, you want me to stand up? Okay. Um, the screenplay is called The Burning Season. The short story was called What the World Will Look Like When All the Water Leaves Us. Um, and in... In the short story, there were loggers who were cutting down trees that were decimating the forest where the lemurs lived. Um, when I met the woman who had become my first advisor, whose name is Dr. Patricia Wright, um, and she and I keep bringing up Jane Goodall, which I shouldn't do, but she, she's sort of known as a Jane Goodall of lemurs. She's at Stony Brook University. She founded a research center and conservation in Madagascar. She's like renowned all over the world and, and just a really incredible specialist. But in my very first conversation with her, I found out that not only were loggers decimating the forest, slash and burn was a, was a decades, you know, decades old practice in Madagascar and the forests were being burnt down and 90% of the forests were gone. Um, and a lot of that burning took place in the period after the rains. And that's where we got the title, The Burning Season and the Burning of These Forests and this woman trying to stop the burning of these forests became an integral part of the, the movie that actually wasn't in the short story and was, you know, had, had a really big role in, in um, expanding the narrative. In terms of bringing on other advisors, I also met some great scientists at Duke University that has an 85-acre lemur sanctuary. Um, and they also had really specific ideas about what um, should and shouldn't be in the movie. For example, they are particularly concerned about illegal pet trade um, and about tourists who are interacting with lemurs. and not having, and scientists who really actually don't interact with the lemurs that much. And in, in the screenplay, you know, there were, there were scenes in the initial draft where she's got like a lemur on her shoulder and she's like cuddling with the lemur and that's just not good to do. Um, for like, it, it gives the wrong message. Um, so, so that was helpful. Um, and then just in terms of, of being accurate, I mean, it, it's been tricky figuring out what we keep in the script and what we don't and what makes a story strong and what is scientifically correct. Um, there's two examples. Our story is set in Southeast Madagascar. There are many, many, many spe different species of lemurs. There's a particular type of lemur, an injury lemur, which is a very um, famous and well-known lemur um, and has a very specific noise and it's just a really interesting animal to talk about. It's not in the Southeast. It's in the short story, but it's not in the Southeast. We decided that even though it wasn't in the Southeast, it made sense just to give an audience who isn't gonna be that aware anyway, more of a sense of, the, of, of all these different species and, and what, what they are and why they're different. Um, there was there, there, another aspect of the story that we, that we grappled with was the primatologist becomes increasingly concerned about the safety of these lemurs and ends up taking a few of them back to a research center. Um, one of my consultants thought that was just fine. Another consultant said a, a primatologist would never ever do that. So we had to decide, this is a character trait, it's what one specific woman does. Um, probably not what a lot of others would do, but it's a movie and we're dealing with somebody who operates in extremes. Um, and so then you're just making that call while you know, getting, different, getting different reads on your script by different specialists and making sure that you're taking all the notes that you possibly can. Does that? Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's not just reaching out to one person, but understanding that you know, people have completely different ideas, but once you have that information, you feel better equipped to like, make the call. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it helps in developing characters. I think it helps in developing story. And then you just really want to be accurate because we're presenting a story to the, you know, to audiences that don't know that much about Madagascar. I knew nothing about Madagascar before I started working on this movie. So, um, you know, following up with that, and anyone can answer this one, um, but I, I'm really curious about how you all feel about uh, the sort of responsibility as filmmakers um, toward uh, sort of presenting scientific information, not just as entertainment, but as, if not educating, um, just as informing people in an accurate way. Um, do you, with because so many people sort of get a lot of information from a movie they might see, um, you know, and they're not doing their own primary research, and maybe someone's only encounter with uh, GMO foods or climate change might be from a movie, 
Um, what responsibility do you think filmmakers have nowadays, especially, to be really be balanced in thinking about the way that they're presenting something, even if it's uh, fiction or even if it's on a documentary? Well, I think, first of all, the, a movie should make people interested in a subject and not tell them everything about it. I think a movie has to be a story that's engaging and that peaks, atten peaks interest and, and peaks attention, but... Um, um, a movie is about characters, first and foremost, I think. Although I, I will say that I, I find that people are very interested in learning new things. And, in, and are, you know, stories can be told, similar stories can be told in terms of personal emotional relationships. But to see the world from a new perspective, to, hear, to see a story told from, you know, a different point of view, um, and to learn new information. So I think in that respect... Mm -hmm it begs us to really dig deep and you know, bring more perspectives into our own research um, to turn around. We, Ginny and I had, um, we, we had done several different grant proposals during the making of the film and we had submitted an NEH um, proposal that had brought a lot of historians into our fold. And we had some really interesting conversations when we, first time we screened the film for them while we were editing. And one of the women historians said to us, it's very rare to see this kind of footage of women working in factories during this time. She said, you just, you don't see it out there. And we had, we had opened the film with an archival sequence. So she was very, and then she said, you know, this, this movie happened at, um, it was really part of the early political women's movement. So she was she sort of brought to us this additional perspective in terms of all of the environmental justice themes that was really it was kind of a there was a little bit of a me too moment happening in 1928 because women had just gotten the right to vote they wanted to use it you know industrialization had taken hold it was the wild west there was no regulation um, even important scientists like marie curie who you know had invented something that ultimately would cure cancer all of the testing and experimentation and what would happen, you know, when people considered it the miracle elixir of all times, um, you know, all of that was yet to unfold. So, it, you know, bringing the historians, bringing the scientists in really sort of gave us a basis for finding ways to make the story contemporary um, to current conversations. Mm -hmm. um, Shereen, with your project, um, you know, I think it, it hits so many different notes. Um, you know, you're talking about um, the you know, water crisis, so you're talking about water chemistry. You're talking about um, a you know, political system that um, you know, is complicit in this. You're talking about community and you're talking about advocacy. Um, you know, in science, we sometimes call these things you know, complex systems stories, um, and they can be a total bear to wrangle um, into something narrative. So I'm wondering, because of the stage you're at with this project, how you are getting your head around something so complex and starting to break it down into something that's accessible to you, um, and how you sort of decide what to include, what not to include um, in a really complex systems story. Um, it, is a, it is a very, very layered story, and um, I like the gesturing. <laughs> Um, let's lift each other up. Um, it is a very, very layered story. And, um, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to have source material because, you know, I don't know, you know, just if I wanted to just make a movie about Flint, uh, there's just so many different perspectives that you could um, tell that story from. And I think um, what appealed to me about this was that it was from such a distinct point of view and it was from the point of view of a woman who was really the game changer because the thing about Flint was that there were so many whistleblowers. There were moms, there were scientists, there were journalists, there were just activists, there were you know, just residents of Flint who were you know, up in arms about the water and what was going on. And, and, and they had been complaining and complaining for such a long time um, and no one was listening. And the thing about this particular character is that because she's a pediatrician, because she had direct access to blood lead levels in children and blood samples, she was actually able to use the science to design a study in order to expose the, wa the lead in the water actually has a direct impact on the blood levels of the children, the blood lead levels of the children. 
And that was what changed the game in Flint. And that was, you know, when people finally started to listen. And so I think, you know, really telling the narrative from her point of view is, for me, what is, you know, that, that kind of thing that I keep going back to, because there are so many, there's so many people, there's so many layers, it's really the story of a community. But anchoring it, you know, in her point of view, and anchoring it in the story of how she used science for social change, and all of the people that she had to bring together in order to design this study, and then go out and um, present the study to the public, and then face the incredible backlash that she faced, and all of the people who stood by her, and all of the people who didn't, and then the people she had to confront later on, and you know, it's also the story of her family and the sacrifices that she had to make and that, you know, um, in order to do this work, because it was, you know, this isn't nine to five work. This is like you're, you're dedicating your life. And she, she's someone who really describes, you know, her patients as her children. And so her own children actually suffered. Um, so there's, you know, there's the story of her family, and then there's also the story of her immigrant family. Her parents are scientists. Her an one of her ancestors was, you know, one of the first public health advocates um, from the Middle East to work in the United States. So it, on that level, it's like this immigration story about, you know, what it, it's about what immigrants have contributed and contribute continue to contribute to this country. So really anchoring it in how she came to be this person who changed the game, you know, uh, um, and the layers of story from her family to her work to her, her community and, um, you know, even her friendships, the important friendships that came into play, I think is what allows me to kind of be like, you know, let me streamline and let this fall away and, you know, let me elaborate on that. And, but I'm very much in the thick of the process, so it's, it's uh, and, and it is a process, you know. I'm, I, th I think my first draft is probably, and, and I'm literally writing the first draft. I spent like six months outlining um, because the, I, the book hasn't even been published yet. So I mentioned before it's being published in June. I got the first draft of the manuscript was over 300 pages. Um, I, I visited Flint and I spent four days with Dr. Mona, the protagonist. Um, and you know a, a bunch of other scientists and activists and you know um, community members. So there, I started with a lot of information, and I'm still in the process of kind of, um, uh, <clears throat> I guess, making it more streamlined. And um, yeah, my first draft will probably be 150 pages. So we'll have to we'll have to narrow it down from there. But the idea of letting the science sort of be the undercurrent of all of it, as opposed to feeling like you have to feature it as the star, um, finding like a way, a person who can really represent all of it has been helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she, um, you know, in a way, the, the science is somewhat front and center because it's really, it was the game changer and it was her, the study that she designed. So, so much of this film um, revolves around her designing this study and, you know, what goes into designing a water study? You know, how do you analyze blood lead levels before a water switch and after a water switch? I have no idea. I mean, I would, I would have had no idea if I hadn't read her book and sat down with her. And, and what's so interesting is, you know, the stakes are actually really high, you know, and you wouldn't always think that about like a study, you know, about research. Um, but if her study's not ironclad, then the backlash has even more ammunition against her. And, and they tried, you know, they tried to find holes in the information that she presented and, and ultimately they, they couldn't. That's great, thank you. Um, you know, continuing on about this idea of science as a character, um, you know, Jenny, I'm wondering if you can speak to this with radium. Um, and you, like me, come from a, you know, you've done some fact-checking. Um, and so looking at, you know, and fact-checking and research are, are similar things where you're really digging into something and trying to understand it, not just sort of the surface facts, but understanding all of the context that it, you know, that it exists within. Um, and I'm wondering how your background um, in research and fact-checking has sort of helped you make radium um, an actual like, character in the film, and if it sort of allows you to th see it as something other than existing for the story and also really being part of the story itself. Sure, so um, 
I actually, I, I found the story, I, or, you know, I didn't find the story, but I, I came across the story of the Radium Girls when I was um, doing research and fact-checking work for a documentary about the Manhattan Project, and there's just this sort of throwaway line in, um, in an autobiography of someone who was involved in the project that said, we all remembered the tragic dial painters of World War I, and I was um, so confused and curious, and, and I looked it up, and um, there were the Radium Girls on Wikipedia. And... Um, so, so for the first, one thing, it was like that was my view, angle into it was as a researcher, and as um, and that's something that I've learned to do in research is when you when I come across something that kind of raises that question mark of, of like going deeper into it, and so that's what happened with the Radium Girls was, um, and I was actually working with my writing partner Brittany Shaw at the time, she was researching a different documentary and. Um, and we just started finding everything we could about them. And that included a lot of science. And um, she and I don't, um, didn't come from a background in science, but we immediately realized that science is at the center of this story, even though it's not, even though it's a story about teenage girls and it's, it's a coming of age story and it's about being, ex you know, having your eyes open to the world around you and to injustice and, um, and, what all of that means, and um, but the the further and further we went, the more and more science there was, and it became this story, and and we realized too that there were so many stories that are a part of this narrative that we couldn't tell. You know, there there could be a movie from the perspective of one of the doctors, and there were so many doctors, and these doctors all had different agendas. Um, there almost became this race to say, I discovered radium poisoning, even though it was these women who really discovered it because it was their bodies that it was happening to. And there was a doctor who was employed by the company and he was putting out studies that um, showed that radium was not dangerous. And he was doing tests on guinea pigs and goats. Um, he actually worked at Columbia University and, um, and you know, he had a, a solid reputation and he, he was saying, um, no, it's not radium poisoning. He also put out a study that said, I think these women have syphilis. And um, that became sort of like another way that these women were discredited. And so um, part of the story is that these girls who are going through this end up learning so much about the way that, uh, the way that like the scientific community operates. And beforehand, they didn't think about it a lot, but if they did think about it, which is, it's also the way that I used to think about it, is like there's, there's one answer, and so like whatever the study is, it shows that answer, and the reality is is that there are um, a lot of different people trying to figure it out, and people are trying to figure it out on behalf of, of different reasons. Some people are like truly seeking the truth, and some people um, have an agenda, and it's, and especially when it's like, radioactivity in the 1920s and people don't really know what it means and what it does, it's really hard to, to tell like, you know, which study should I believe in here? And I right. think that's something that people still struggle with today. Yeah, I mean, this story feels incredibly modern. When you describe it like that of a bunch of teenage girls not being believed um, over, you know, a powerful man. I mean, we have examples of that very recently with um, all of the gymnasts, for example. You know, this, it, it's so resonant um, that, you know, especially these young women were just not believed and that they fought back so hard and actually made progress is quite profound. Um, but you brought up something else that's really interesting that your, the characters um, in the film sort of learn how to be scientific thinkers. Um, and I think that you know, there might be this idea that women in film and, uh, and, and STEM subjects um, sounds very niche, but um, it's not at all because uh, you don't need to profile a woman scientist. Um, you know, you can just have the scientific thinking. So I'm wondering in the, you know, for any of you to answer um, the characters in your, in your films, how you sort of show that curiosity, that sort of radical new ideas of tinkering, of pushing back on the status quo. I think I gotta take that one with Hetty being my character. Um, how do you show that curiosity? You know, we really played with that uh, with Bombshell. Um, it was really fun to try and figure out how to show her inventive mind. And it really came to us very slowly how her inventive mind permeated every aspect of her life. And so we started to want to draw on footage, which we didn't at the beginning want to do. 
But we made it this trope, this way that you could see her, her tinkering, curious mind, uh, which I think is so important, right? Translating that very interior experience into something that the film can, can show you as a viewer and make you feel. And we realized we had to start with her very young and create something where you understood right away that that's what we were doing. So we, we did that with the music box. It's outlined, it flies apart, it comes back together, you see that outline. And then we had freedom. We could go back and draw on footage wherever we wanted and say, look, you know, you know, this is her inventive mind, even though it's the plastic surgery. We're being told by plastic surgeons that she was pioneering something. She was actually <laughs> redesigning her own face. She was creating a, a hotel, yes, but she was also recreating Austria with her inventive mind. You know, these things, these traits that very curious, incredible inventors like Hetty have permeate every aspect of their life and express themselves in all these interesting ways. So that was great fun, actually, to figure out and to and to do with the film. And the framing of that, um, and I think it's really interesting, and Lydia, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, over time how you've seen um, this change in the way that um, women and science are captured in film, um, where it's not novel to have a woman scientist or a woman uh, using science to you know, drive whatever her purpose is. Um, the fact that she's a woman is almost incidental, perhaps. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any sort of trends or inflection points that you've seen over time about how um, films are approaching profiling women like this or just using them in that way. Sure. Um, well, I've spent a lot of my career, and it, just, it wasn't anything I thought about ahead of time, it just happened that I tend to make movies that are female-driven, um, not exclusively, but I would say predominantly. And uh, it just it's just because I was drawn to stories that related to my experience. And it was really, you know, when Sundance and Women in Film did that first study, um, that indicated, I don't know what has it been, like four or five years now, that first indicated that the um, participation in women in the entertainment business hadn't changed in 15 years, that the needle hadn't moved. It, it was something that I actually can't, I wasn't that aware of because I run my own company and I work with women and I hire women and we tell women's story and the world looked pretty good to me. So, <laughs> but it, we decided, you know, I, I work with the Producers Guild and we decided to kind of, you know, step up to the agenda. We're one of the guilds that's actually 50-50 in, in our gender balance, and, um, but most of the other guilds are not. And so we, you know, we got into it, and we got into um, looking at the data on the stats between um, the industry and women and the commercial power of women in the audience and really trying to sort of understand, and Shereen and I were talking outside a little bit before about the difference between facts and narrative. Because there, there you know, we certainly have been, we've, we've sort of ridden a long crest in our business where you know, the facts are changing and, and the knowledge is changing, but the narrative hasn't changing. And so we, we sort of set out to debunk, the, debunk these narratives that we felt were, had become myths. These things like women don't go to the movies, women don't, I mean, the, the reality is, is that women, you know, outnumber men in terms of movie going, TV watching, social platforms. We're, you know, 85% of all consumer decisions are made by women. Two thirds of consumer wealth is where we're headed in terms of um, the power of women economically. So our, our argument was you're leaving it on the table if, if you're not including women as your audience. You know, so audience is, is one thing that I got very obsessed with. And um, that project led into a whole nother exploration around implicit and unconscious bias because stereotypes are the thing and this relates to women in science, stereotypes are the thing that we really have to battle as, in, as content creators. Um, and Common Sense Media did a very interesting study that they released last year to really evaluate at what age children start to develop these stereotypes. And it's like age two to six is when kids start to understand their gender and the difference in genders. And then seven to 10 is when they start to associate and tie their gender status to occupations and academic interests. And, and then from there, it's only uphill. So I think, you know, I think what we've, 
really done successfully is identify the problem. There's some change happening, I think, especially for women because of, because of the um, democratization of platforms and distribution, and there's more access in television, and everybody's watching content so many different kinds of ways. It's, it's all good for women. But I think that we're at a point now, and that's, it's a little bit of what the current Me Too movement is, is, I think, headed toward, which is systemic issues. And the fact, I think women in science particularly are, have been, and well, frankly, I mean, every field, institutional um, discrimination has been one of the biggest problems. And so that, you know, that has to be overcome. And we're talking about changing, I think we're talking about changing systems, talk, talk about changing hierarchies that um, allow for female perspectives to come in, which we have now proven are highly profitable. Thank you. Um, I want to do one more quick question before we go to um, open it up for questions. Um, just sort of sort of pushing this into the future. Because um, what I really love about all of the work that you guys are, are doing right now is that it doesn't feel like it's a, women's, a woman's story. It feels accessible to everyone. Um, in the ways that we're going to talk about perhaps some of the things in the future, a lot of the films we're seeing on technology, um, a lot of the ways that society is relating to science and technology in the future, um, we still see a lot of like, you know, sexy humanoid robots who are women who are distracting the men and that's why the world is falling apart. Um, you know, do you think that uh, <laughs> what is, which is a kind of unoriginal take really, it's just they're robots instead of human women. Um, do you guys have ideas for how, when we're talking about these, again, these things are so relevant to our culture right now and people are hungry for stories, but what's a different way of doing that than the way we keep seeing? Any ideas? <laughs> you mean a different way of presenting sci-fi? Yeah, a well, a different way, not even sci-fi, but when we are thinking about what the future might look like with AI, with robotics. Um, or even now, you know, at a, a conference they had to show off how um, agile the new robots were. There were, um, they turned them into strippers um, to show how well that they moved, um, which I don't know who decided to do that, but that's, you know, that's sort of where we're at when we're talking about technology. So what's like a better way to talk about technology in the future um, without resorting to those tropes? Well, I think, <laughs> can I say something? Um, I'll just say, Rhea. Wave your hand. <laughs> Rhea's one of my graduate students at NYU, and she's working on a television series about women in tech. And we've been having, already been having some pretty interesting conversations because you worked at Google for years, and you said to me that tech design is not, you know, is not really optimized for women. You know, the way the size of cell phones are, are more thought of in terms of the size of male hands or, you know, just all these, yeah. What, say it again. Yeah, Apple Health for a long time didn't include women's health in that app, but it's changing. And I was, um, we were talking about tech design. And tech design, you know, there was a, another colleague of mine on the West Coast who was working on a television series called The, uh, Bold, the Bold Type, I think. And she was talking about a storyline in the series where women are really, can be very affected while watching VR if it's happening during their during their period and they could become physically ill and it's related to hormonal changes that happen as we all watch different kinds of content in different ways. So there's, there's so many storylines about technology and how it relates to women. I think probably particularly in women's healthcare, it's a big deal. And I think it's really up to us to sort of get out and ex excavate those stories and tell them in different ways. And you know, I think that I think that's I think that's the future. I mean, I think that you know, I think more women. Jen, I'm going to say something that you told me when we st when we were out there in the hall. You said that you've got an editor in chief at Scientific American, and it's the first time you've ever felt that your voice was valued, right? <laughs> so I think it, I think it's different as we can change the system and as we create and as we have more inclusive and more more gender balanced, more diversity balanced, um, people who are decision makers, the stories that get told will be different. And I think the key is the decision makers, like in my mind, because these these movies like, you know, artificial intelligence and, you know, these are really big budget films. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of it comes down to the people at the top and the kinds of movies that they feel 
will work, have always worked, and overly relying on those things and not wanting to risk trying something different. So it, I think that kind of comes down to something that's systemic and um, very slowly, hopefully, as we see more and more women and you know just more diverse people rise to the top in some of those positions, we'll see different kinds of movies. Great, thanks. Um, let's open it up to questions. Sure. Um, I think, let me... Hi, my name is Crystal Every. Good, I'm a filmmaker. My current film, Black Women in Medicine, features chemists and mathematicians and just went global. The current film I'm working on is called Changing the Face of STEM. So here is my dilemma. I just interviewed about 50 STEM professionals and I am constantly being challenged as a filmmaker that I'm not as smart as they are. Did you experience that in the folks that you were working with? And I'm constantly being challenged. Now we could say it's because they're analytical and they think creative is you know, a whole other world. But I think that the most creative scientists, the best scientists are scientists that have creativity. But in your experience, how did your subject matters or your scientific team respond when you were in conflict with what they wanted to see? Yeah, that's a great question that I encounter as a journalist, and I think everyone working on science stories encounters, so who would like to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I can say that the very first conversations I had with scientists, I, f I felt like I didn't know what I was talking about. I'd read a couple of books, but I still felt wildly um, unknowledgeable compared to them. And I think I approached it as, listen, you're the specialist, you're the expert, I really wanna know everything that you can possibly tell me. Um, and you know, there's still so, so, so much I don't know, but as you know, I've been working on this project almost three years, and now I know a whole lot more, and now my conversations with primatologists have become a lot easier because I think we speak slightly the same language even though they know a thousand times more than I do, but I think it's, I mean, I think it's never a, never a bad thing to approach an expert and say, I know nothing, can you tell me all of your knowledge? I think people like to share their knowledge. That's, that's my experience, at least. I, th I think also you are as smart as they are. I think the challenge is, and the challenge for all of us as storytellers, is that we have to make it understandable mm -hmm. to the general public. We have to, you know, we have to make it digestible and understandable. And we really, really grappled and struggled with that on The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks because we're talking about an immortal cell line. Most people don't know what that means. Most people don't know that until Henrietta Lacks had her cancer cells cultured, that they were the first cells to ever live outside the human body for long enough for research to be performed. And she kicked off the entire genetic revolution because her, she created the first immortal cell line. But to explain that to people in the beginning of the movie, we really, I mean, we went through so many permutations, testing it, getting feedback, because it doesn't, you know, it does, it's, it's important information, but we have to tell it in a way that everybody else can understand it. Um, yeah. By the way, thank you well, for that I, I, Oh, you got yeah. it? Okay. <laughs> we included her in our book. Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, my name's Claire Sabag, and first I just want to thank, thank you all for the work that you're doing. Um, I'm a screenwriter, and I've written a script um, on Rosalind Franklin, and um, I know that some people here know about her, and uh, for those who don't, um, she's the scientist that was able to develop the uh, structure of the double helix of DNA, and she's really the mother of that discovery. And um, like Janine, you said that when you were researching something else, you had this throwaway line um, about the radium girls, and I had a similar experience. I was reading some book about science and tech science and faith. I was actually researching God for, for myself. And um, anyways, it was written by Francis Collins, who's the, um, who was the head of the Genome Project. And he mentioned Rosalind Franklin, who was the scientist that I just described, um, 
who discovered the structure of DNA, and I thought, well, why don't I, why didn't I know that, you know? And um, so I started my journey, and I did years, I did about five years of research on Rosalind Franklin. Um, I'm not a scientist, but um, I think it helped me, because I think what it made me do was to understand the science so much that I could describe it to a non-science a scientist. Um, I've been trying to market the script, you know, through the usual channels, and um, so I'm just putting out a word that I have on a piece of, like, paper, actually. It's like a 20th century, like, thing. I've, I've got a synopsis here. Um, it's a really great script. It's entertaining, and, um, and it's so timely. It's like, why don't we all know? I'm sorry. <laughs> but why don't we all know that the person that had the greatest scientific achievement of the 20th century was a woman? Like, why don't we all have that in our soul? I think and, that, I just, going okay. off of that question, I, I think that that's probably something that you've all encountered. Um, I know I get books sent to my office all the time that, the, you know, the uh, title is The 87 Women Scientists Who Changed Everything About the World That You Have No Idea About. Um, there are so, there's so much material. Um, I'm wondering, it's, you know, are you in, I guess the question is, why don't we know about these people? Um, is there a certain way that you choose even how you, um, who, who you are featuring or what stories you deem um, you know, best to tell through, uh, through a film when there are so many options? Well, I think actually that the thing that amazes me is that, is that those stories are all there and you just have to look for them. And it actually, you know, there's layers of how far down you have to go to like keep looking, but those, those stories and like more and more and more of them are there and they're incredible. And when, whenever I, I stumble across a story like that, I can't believe um, that I have never heard of them before. Like that happens for me all the time with like history and science and um, inc like incredible women that I, and, and sort of journeys that I never knew of. And I think that, um, the more that we look for them, the more that people who are making media and our writers um, start gravitating towards that material and start creating it, and then, then um, I think that's stuff that audiences will really respond to. So I think also it just you have to like it has to be said like history was written by men, and so they controlled the narrative for such a long time, and that's one of the reasons why women's achievements and women's incredible stories have been buried. So I'm mean, good for you for, for writing that, and I wish you the best of luck. But let's, let's focus for, on funding for a second. You know, I think a lot of these stories have been known, and people have been shopping around these ideas for years and been ignored. Multiple, Multiple. factors going into I why mean, there are so many stories that are not well known. Yeah, it takes a, you know, you need a, a, a Doran, you need a Sloan, otherwise that's never gonna get off the ground. You know, you'll be shopping around this great idea and it will have no rocket fuel. And, and so the, that, that sea change has to happen. And for the longest time, I mean, just to kind of piggyback on that, for the longest time in our industry, um, putting a woman you know, at the center of a movie, and, and the producers can speak more to this, but that was considered something you couldn't get financed, that there was no, that, that women, apparently female actors, could not carry the box office. So, you know, I, that's changing now too, but I mean, it, it's sort of shocking that it's only changing now. Um, it's, you know, we, and we still have a long way to go. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's really nuts, and I can speak to this too as, as working, my day job is as a development executive. I mean, we have, we have a project we're working on that's about the, a woman who lived her entire life as a man in the 1800s so that she could work as a doctor. Um, and in stated manners, of, in, in stated um, sanitation and, and treated an entire leaper colony and just made enormous strides. She performed one of the first known cesareans that saved both mother and child in, in 1826. Um, I was completely unaware of her. I think that the accomplishments that she had, had she been a man, everybody would have known who she was. Um, and the story was brought to us by an actress we were working with. And it's, I mean, it's an incredible story that I knew nothing about until two years ago. Um, but it's, it's, I think you just need to keep looking for these stories. And, Thank you. Uh, let's, let's just, you've been waiting for a long time. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, hi, so I have a question for like all of you. 
but Miss Dini in particular. So having just watched your wonderful movie about Hedy Lamar, and it's been a long, it's been quite a bit and a lot of advancement in women in STEM since Hedy Lamar's time. Do you think she would be proud of us? And do you think she would be proud of how far we've come? And just as general to all of you, do you think we should be proud of how far we've come? And is it far enough? Or are we still falling short? I'm definitely going to take that. Big question. <laughs> um, I think she'd be proud of you. I think she'd be very proud of you. Um, look, I think she'd be proud to see real strides made in education, in opportunities. I don't think she'd be proud of Silicon Valley. And I worry that if Hedy Lamar were alive today, she would be in Silicon Valley trying to raise money for her next brilliant idea. And people would be closing their eyes and imagining that she just doesn't look quite enough like Thomas Edison. And I did a series for two years on inventors, and I talked to many women who had that very experience. So I think we tend to pat ourselves on the back prematurely and become complacent. And I don't want us to become complacent on this issue. The biggest problem is we have actually seen declining numbers of young women in STEM fields since the 90s. They're going down at an alarming rate. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just a, you know, a theoretical problem. It's not just a diversity problem. It's a problem for our future. Because what we're saying is we're going to let basically one gender design this future, this, this, this extraordinary, awesome, very frightening future we're going to go into that's going to be completely directed by STEM fields. One gender. And what does that mean? What does that mean for the next generation if it's all designed by them? You know, we have to get the young women to step up. And I think young women can do, you know, such amazing things in that field. Young women can mold it into something so much more, um, well, heady-like. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and so if we don't make these films, if we don't step up now and, and not only author these films, but show these women to the next generation, I think we, you know, we're gonna have real problems in the future. So I hope that change comes. And I, I think we're actually out of time, or do we have? We're out of time. Yeah, I will, I, um, I wanna, that was a great place to wrap up and also just to, to end this, to say that because of filmmakers like all of you, it's not just about women in STEM, but the women who are telling the stories of, of STEM. Um, and so it's really broad and I think we all have a responsibility to sort of accelerate that to the forefront. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.